Hey, welcome to Millsap Farm. Uh, this evening we're doing a twilight walk where we invite people to come out to the farm and spend time with us uh, touring the fields, talking about what's going on on the farm during this time period of the year and, uh, and just really digging deep into the technical details of how to grow. So today we're focusing on uh, cut flowers, particularly with an eye toward how do you produce cut flowers for Mother's Day. So my farm manager, Kimby, who manages all the flowers, is gonna do most of the visiting and explanations today. And uh, then I'm just there to kind of support and fill in details of, of uh, soil management and weed management, those kinds of details. So uh, I hope you enjoy this piece. I hope it's uh, helpful as you consider how do flowers fit on your farm. So the interesting thing to note about this tunnel is in our cold in February, um, I had triple row cover because these anemones had just started blooming. So I had triple row cover and under this plastic and that's what they had and they came through it just fine. Um, yeah, yay, <laughs> I'm glad. And there was also ridiculous in there. They were not blooming, but they were in there. Um, uh, I think it's, it's mostly 30. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, ag 34. Ag 34. But the, the weight will be one ounce. Or one ounce, yeah. We have some of the lighter stuff, but we don't like it because it rips too much. I know. So. Um, and the other things that are going on in here, I've got this bed is full of stock and it's transplanted at different times. Hopefully, I don't know. Anyway, hopefully it'll bloom at different times as well. And then in the middle is kind of some experiments for me. Um, I planted a bunch of campanula. They were plugs um, that I got this spring and they actually got caught in that really cold spell and were three weeks in a box instead of like five days that they're supposed to be or three days. So they were a little slow. Um, so I don't know, so that's an experiment. I'm hoping that they'll bloom for Mother's Day, but I'm not sure, they're not doing much. And Mother's Day is only two and a half weeks away. So I really don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> exactly. Well, and I, I also know for Campanula, it's actually better to fall plant those as well. So for any of you guys doing to do that, fall plant them. Um, yeah, and so for last night, we, we covered these with just a single row cover under this. Oh, the other thing going on in here is we just put a shade cloth on this tunnel um, the middle of April. And that is because I've, most of the stuff in here would appreciate it still being a little cool. Um, so I'm trying that out. I haven't done a whole lot of that. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it works. But um, you're, feel free to peek and ask questions. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, you said you did like three row covers on it. So how does that work when you have like a warm day in winter? Do you have to come out? So that was only during like that really oh, okay. cold two weeks okay. where we had like no sun and so the really cold the degrees. Under that um, yeah, I had a single row cover. So I had, um, you can see these little hoops. I have these little tiny hoops in there. Oh, okay, yeah. um, and then I had just a single row cover over it most of the time. Okay. And you can just kind of leave it that way. Okay. And then when they started blooming, it's good to take it off because sometimes they'll get they get caught. What is what? The big white ones. Those are anemones. Um, the variety is, I don't remember. Um, I'll tell you in a minute, but not right now. <laughs> yeah, they're the white, they're the light centers. So. Do you have any other questions right now? Uh, I'll point okay. out that what, what, one of the things that Kimby and I talk a lot about is how do we create different microclimates, right? So the, mm. so the big greenhouse stays above freezing all winter long. We do a lot of wood heat, um, we do a lot of propane in there, and, uh, and so that's the warmest environment we have, more or less. The Chinese greenhouse kind no, of. No, it's still warmer though. Yeah, it's the Chinese greenhouse is more warmer, stable. Uh, yeah, overall. And then, um, and then we have the Chinese greenhouse, so that's a little bit behind that. And then we have the, the regular high tunnel. Um, which again, you know, cover high, high being the high structure. Like, and those as we uncover, could you like cover them? Like, as we leave, look at things that's going to be outside. Yeah. So if we plant something, you know, like the ranunculus and anemones, a lot of those were planted right in the same time frame this year, and yet we get this staggered harvest because you know, the ones in the greenhouse are going to pop first, and then we're going to see them in the Chinese greenhouse, and then we're going to see them in here. So, although we've stopped doing anemones in the greenhouse because they don't seem to like yeah. Them. Too hot, too soon. Yeah. No, they do really well in the Chinese greenhouse, but it's because it's a more stable environment. But this time, right now, they're they're almost done. 
whereas these guys are still really happy. Yeah. So. Well, one of the things that causes us to think a lot about and have a lot of conversations about is what are we managing this space for? And then let's make sure that the items that we're putting in there work together. So like putting the, one of the reasons that anemones don't work in the big greenhouse is because we're, we're managing that really for tomato and pepper starts mm -hmm. and other you know, warm, warm weather starts in the spring. Sure. And so that really doesn't work. The ranunculus tolerate it better. They, they do until right now. <laughs> and now they're like, nope, <laughs> so I don't like do it anymore. A lot of aggressive venting. We vent more than we probably would if we were just growing tomatoes and peppers. And yeah. We want to cool it. We want it to not be above 80. Those are kind of our goals. So. It's a goal. Um, but on day, even a day like today, that's not really very reasonable. Yeah, it was like 76 or 78 in there today. Yeah. So yeah. with the sides open. <laughs> so. We're all sweating. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then freezing would tip outside. So anyway, that's that's the idea. Is that, and then the outside stuff would be, you know, behind that. So you'll see a lot of examples of that where there's, you go, you know, there's an enemies here and there's an enemies there and there's or snapdragons here, snapdragons there. But that's why we're doing that to hit different timing. Cool. All right, we're gonna just go over to the other kitten. Okay, so, so this is my fall planted. So a lot of, are you guys all familiar with like fall planting? And okay, so this is my fall planted protected space, but not heated at all. It's just under this plastic. It's been under this plastic. And so it was planted October-ish. Um, and I've got Chinese forget-me-nots in here that are incredibly short that I'm hoping will get longer as they get bigger. Um, I have found that they don't work for me outside like they won't overwinter outside. They have to be a little bit more protected for me. Um, and then I've got poppies and they just started yesterday. I had my first poppy yesterday. So um, that's a really great Mother's Day flower. Not that it's a great Mother's Day flower per se, but it, like it's a good timing. It hits right about now and we'll keep going for quite a few weeks, so. Yeah, well, I, I, I like to transplant everything um, because I don't like direct seeding. Yeah. Curtis likes direct seeding. Well, the so. like it too. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we, we seed those. Actually, I can tell you. I, I think I have that written down. We seed those around August, around the beginning of August, and then they get transplanted around, in October. Okay, yeah. So they did um, and then the really crazy toss up is agrostemma, which we'll see some more out in the field that's actually not so covered up. And this is my first year growing that, so it's fun. It's like three times as tall in here as it is in the field. It's kind of fun. Um, and then I've got scabiosia in there as well, which is also not blooming yet, but I hope really soon. So that's this one. And then we're going to look in the high tunnel, which is behind us here. Um, and these are the things in the high tunnel. These were all planted, well, middle end of March. Um, and You'll see some things in here that I'm hoping will bloom for Mother's Day. <laughs> so um, again, there's not too much to see because they're all covered, but we've got, I've got sunflowers in here. Um, I have sunflowers and I have zinnias and I have a bunch of snapdragons. And these are, so these are all spring planted things. I'm really hoping, like last year I had sunflowers for Mother's Day, so I'm really hoping I have sunflowers for Mother's Day this year. We'll see. When did you start the sunflowers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, March 1st, with the idea that they were going to be transplanted in March 15th, and I think they didn't actually, I don't have the actual date on this paper, but they didn't actually get in March 15th, it was a little bit later than that. I have one sunflower accidentally that it's just growing in my tunnel and it's like this big. And I did put cloth over it just in case, but I don't know. It might not even bloom. It was a volunteer. So. Yeah, no, it probably will. I'll, I'll have to tag you with it. There you go. Um, the other thing to know about um, protection in here, like last night, so these are pro this is propane um, heated last night. So we covered things and then heated them with propane because there are also peppers in here. It's oh. not just for the sunflowers, it's also for the peppers. <laughs> So the peppers probably like it pretty warm at night, even though it's like tomorrow night it's not really going to frost. You guys probably still heat the peppers, or do you not heat them at night? Once we will we'll heat them tonight, but we probably won't okay. heat them after that. So they usually stay pretty yeah. warm in here. We technically have um, 
thermometers that give us warnings if the temperatures are too low, yeah. and they mostly work. Yeah, we have one that's Wi-Fi so. too, or whatever. Bluetooth. Yeah. It's annoying. How so. did you guys get one? 25? I think it was 25. Okay. We, we when I finally remember to look at the temperature, it was 27, but yeah. it was cold. Yeah. Honestly, there's a point that I woke up that my, my phone said it was 23, but that's not here, so. And were you telling about the temperature monitoring? <laughs> yeah, I briefly mentioned it, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of, the, one of the big breakthroughs for us in terms of ability to do things in the winter was when we started having remote monitoring of temperatures. Because before that, if we had stuff that needed to be warm, uh, we didn't know if it wasn't. Right. I mean, you know, if something happened, yeah. we just didn't know. And so, um, so that either meant that I didn't sleep. <laughs> you just randomly wake up and Which check? Was, yeah, I mean, I, I, for many years, I had like a two hour, you know, if it was below 20 degrees, I'd get up every two hours and go check things and go, and not, not all winter long, but you know, this time of right. year, if you haven't cold. So um, that makes for really unproductive days following. <laughs> it's like zombie land. And uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd like to claim that's my reason for being zombie. Um, uh, but you can see hanging down here, oop, Oh, it's hanging. It's, it's hanging, hanging there. right there. It's kind of low. They're just little bitty things. The, with the system we use is from Accurite, and I chose that because there is no subscription fee. There are several systems, but a lot of them require you to pay, you know, ten dollars a month or whatever or more. And I didn't like that. Um, and they're very cheap. Uh, those little sensors are like ten dollars or less a piece. And the the base system I think was about a hundred. So for so for under one hundred fifty dollars, I can track about six spaces. And it works pretty well all over our farm. It's not perfect, but we get pretty decent coverage. Um, and it will text me or Kimby or whoever we want it to when the temperature drops. So you can you can set your temperatures and say if it gets above 90, you want to text. If it gets below 35, I want to text. And it will and then you can set that number as your you know get out of bed alarm. And uh, and that's saved us a lot of sleep. And it's also helped us not burn as much fuel, which is also interesting, because the other, the other compensating thing we would do is just stoke the furnace no matter what. You know, just fill it up and, or, or turn up, you know, run the propane no matter what. And after a couple of years of using that, we realized we didn't really need to do that nearly as much as we had been. We could ease off some of that and we were still keeping the temperature we wanted. So, uh, but it is a key part of if you're gonna hit, you know, these dates, you really have to be ready to protect things from frost because, you know, otherwise, I mean, you can't grow sunflowers in, early April if you're not going to have a temperature monitor and a tunnel and a row cover. Yeah. And even then, maybe. <laughs> maybe. It's just happening so quick and you can't reverse it. Like, what's done is done. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Freeze, is da freeze, freeze is permanent. Yeah. That's a very expensive mistake. Yep. Uh, so, but at the same time, you know, we also, uh, we have always been of the opinion that our season extension is just that. It's not season right. extension. We're not year-round growers. Yeah. We don't want to run a 70 degree greenhouse all through the winter. The, the economics and the environmental impact and the stress on all of us. Um, you know, the way we run our farm right now, uh, Kimby's family can take off for a couple weeks in the winter and our family can take off for a couple weeks in the winter and neither one of us have to get too stressed about that. If we had $10,000 worth of propane, heating tomatoes and whatever else we might choose to grow in a hot greenhouse like that, we would not be low stress. <laughs> so that's kind of nice that we can do that. And, and that's part of our flower choice. Right, and it's part of, yeah. So you're, you're picking cool season flowers like ranunculus and anemones who really like it cool. And then you're slowly like doing the, the hardy winter, the hardy annuals. You're doing the hardy annuals and fall planting those and those make it through. Like, you know, so you choose which ones. I mean, I'm pushing it when I plant zinnias and and marigolds. and mar well, I don't have marigolds in there, oh, but no, sunflowers. Oh, oh, no, um, you know, that's that's definitely pushing it. And so if they die, they die. But otherwise, I get them at Mother's Day, and that's great. <laughs> so, um, and that's one of the things like for for planning. And a lot of times, like so, I, I because we have quite a few sales outlets, um, we can kind of go. Okay, I just need a lot of flowers all the time. And my hope is, is that I'll hit Mother's Day with flowers. Sometimes it doesn't work. So sometimes it's like, oh, I just missed it by a week. Um, but because, I mean, we're, we're not a florist, so we're not, you know, we don't promise to have things or promise things until like that we have them. And uh, so, so we have a little bit of flexibility that way. And also it's like a lot of times it's like, well, 
it's like some of my harvest dates are, are really, they're based on like Johnny's days of maturity, which aren't actually accurate for what I'm growing in my field. Like a lot of times, like the zinnias, I think don't even, aren't supposed to bloom in here until May or something based on their days of maturity, but I always have them in, in or the end of May, and I always have them in the beginning of May. So like there's a little, but a lot of that stuff I could be fine tuning, but I just haven't taken the time to do that yet. Um, I probably should, but I haven't. So, but you it's just like, that, yeah, well, and it's, it's the idea of like, you just plant, you just keep planting as much as you can in the succession and have a lot of diversity in a lot of different places. And some of it works. <laughs> We're going to walk past the Chinese greenhouse. I'm not going to go in today. Um, cause there's really not much mother's day stuff in there, but we're going to go past it cause it's cool and walk around that way. And we'll look at some more fall planted stuff out there. So, so you're welcome to peek your head in if you yes, want yes. If you want to look in the Chinese greenhouse, feel free to do so. We call it the Chinese greenhouse because the plans were in Chinese to build it. So that's why it's called the Chinese greenhouse. <laughs> it is a passive solar berm greenhouse. Yeah. So this is the agrostemma here, and again, like that stuff that was in the, in the other, in, underneath the plastic was like this tall. So, I mean, this is perfectly tall enough. I don't really need it that tall. So if this blooms okay, I'll probably actually just grow it outside next year instead of in the tunnel, but it was an experiment for me. Um, I also find that with my fall planted stuff, like Sometimes it makes it through the winter and sometimes it doesn't and sometimes like 50% of it makes it through and sometimes and, and so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll fall plant things and then I'll actually also spring plant those same things and frequently just plug it right into the same bed because I have all these holes and that drives me crazy. I don't like holes. So, um, so you'll see there's just a bunch of different stuff um, if you want to walk down this. At the end there's bachelor's buttons um, that are just starting to open. Um, and most of this stuff, so these guys, this is Orlea and it's not real happy. I don't know. It's beautiful last year. Not beautiful this year. Um, and I've got just a little bit of feverfew and then there's some Bells of Ireland and Bupleurum mixed together. So some of those, the Bells of Ireland that are bigger are the ones that survived. Uh, the ones that are smaller are the ones that are spring planted. Um, and then the rest of these three beds are also all flowers that have been put out, but they're not going to make it for Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. No. I got one to one to germinate, and then put. I got so mad at the rest of it, I just put it outside, and it went through cold snap, and then about half of them came out. Yeah, I was gonna say that's. <laughs> that's the truth. Yeah, you fend for yourself and it did better than me taking care of it. So. Yeah, um, I mean, Bufflorum is one that they prefer, it prefers to be direct seeded. Um, I, I actually have pretty good luck with those. I have both good luck with both of them in the spring when I, when I do them really early in like, I say spring, it's like winter. Uh, I think I seed them in like January. Um, in the, yeah, and yeah, that's winter. Um, I think of it spring because it's like spring planted, but um, I, I have really good luck when I do them then and we just treat them like we do all of our seeds and so they get they get seeded and they get put in a germination chamber that like keeps the humidity up and once they start popping then we just pull them out and put them like this year it's it's a heated table it's a high humidity and not super hot but not super cold um and then but I when I do these for the fall planting they need to get germinated some I don't know like August or something and I have a lot harder time with that um, I will put them in, we call uh, it's our tomato room, which we keep at about 55, 60 degrees. Um, and so a lot of times, instead of putting them in a germination chamber, I'll put them in there because it's, it's, it's just a lot cooler. Um, you just have to watch that sometimes because sometimes they dry out because they're taking longer because it's cooler, but they'll actually germinate as opposed to in the greenhouse where it's like 95 something silly degrees. So any other questions about fall planted stuff. So this is like, this is what you can do if you have no greenhouse or high tunnel or anything. Um, that's what, that's what this is. <laughs> and then these ones here. So these are agrostemma is the taller ones. I did Orlea in the top, but it's not happy today. Like it's not happy this year, but some years it works. Um, agrostemma, then we have feverfew, but that one actually won't bloom to the end of May. 
Um, then I have Bupleurum and Bells of Ireland, which also probably won't hit Mother's Day. They'll probably be afterwards. Um, and then I've got Bachelor's Buttons, which are starting now. So they, they will be a nice filler flower for me. They'll be great. Um, I think, yeah, that's pretty much what I have out here. Sometimes I do Nigella and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't for me in the fall. I frequently just spring plant it now because it works better for me. It's direct seeding? I don't. I don't like really? direct seeding. <laughs> I don't either, but I, I heard you don't have much luck. No, I, um, how do I do it? No, I just it put it in like one inch. Around. It doesn't, but I put it in one inch soil blocks and, okay. and they, they do okay. I try and transplant them out before they get too big. I don't know, I, I find it pretty much, if I can get it in soil blocks, then, then it's okay. It's mainly if as long as they don't get root bound and stuff. So. Um, cool. I'll point out that under this row cover is a bunch of status. Oh yeah. And we learned an important lesson this year. <laughs> we actually learned this lesson many times. But the one thing that Kimmy and I have learned is you really can't take plants out of the greenhouse and stick them outside and then have a sudden weather change. Um, I mean, hardening off, you know, mostly probably... Well, they don't. even did harden but off a little. We did harden them off, that, that was, but, we, but it didn't get very hard. That was... That no. Was and so, uh, you know, normally status is a pretty hardy crop, so we wouldn't really worry about it in the frost. And obviously it came through last night. It looked like it came through last night pretty good. Mostly, layer. yeah. Um, but uh, we had a little uh, kind of unexpected frost. It was just a barely, like a 31-degree frost. Uh, it was about a week after, two weeks after we transplanted it out. And it looked like it was dead. I mean, they were the gone. Back to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. So we were kind of surprised <laughs> by that. So then they came back. <laughs> yeah. So now we cover it. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. But uh, but I think that you know the, the the moral of that is just to remember that normal hardiness rules don't necessarily apply if you raised something in the house and had pretty mild weather. You know, so it right. it hadn't really had. I mean, it was one of those things that got kind of caught because it had 70 degree weather and then. 60 degree weather at least and then we got that 30 degree snap and so it just the doll survived we actually thought it was dead i really did it's i thought it was all dead. dead and i was so sad because they were the prettiest status plants i had ever transplanted mm -hmm. <laughs> they were gorgeous they were really nice. <laughs> apparently because they were vigorously growing along at 70 degrees yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um oh i guess we can go look at the overwintering snapdragons yeah, we should, we should go do that yeah, those are good Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, they're still there. Yay, they're so you can see like, so these guys are a little unhappy because they're under a cover and so they're bending and doing funky things, which tomorrow we'll take all the covers off and they'll straighten back up. Um, and they did start blooming. So these guys got planted in October and then they were really happy and they grew a lot and then they got cold. And so one of the things that people do a lot with um, snapdragons is that you pinch them. But if you're doing fall planting, there's no need to pinch because the cold will pinch it for you multiple times, maybe too many times, <laughs> uh, which is what happened to some of these guys. They got pinched so much that they're like, they've got so many little stems coming up and so they're blooming kind of short like this instead of really tall. Um, but that's the early ones. The, these are my Chantillys, Rebecca. I actually have some. <laughs> There's like five of them <laughs> and they're all like this big, but um, I do plant like I do chantillys and some if I I had a hard time getting seed this year, so I don't have a lot of chantillys, but chantillys and um, coast, co Costa, I think I'll look that up real quick. Um, yeah, Costa mix. And then Madden Butterflies and a Potomac mix are the ones that I do. And so, especially in the spring, they, they stagger as far as when they start to be, to start blooming. So the, the Costas and the, um, the, uh, the Chantillys start early. They start first and then the Madden Butterflies and the Potomacs will be last. And if you're going to field plant, you want to use Potomacs. The other ones don't do as well. I mean, you can get, do the Madden Butterflies work, but they're just so delicate that I would be afraid to have them in the rain. <laughs> but but the but the Potomac's too great, but they're a standard standard looking snap. So um yeah so I these guys are gonna start kind of exploding really soon now. I'm just I'm kind of I'm excited but also dreading 
the snapdragons. They're lovely. Um, yeah, any questions on that? So we, we get the vast majority of our flower seeds from Johnny's. Um, I would say I have been told that Geo seeds is, is cheaper, but they also, they also take a really long time. So you want to make sure that you give yourself lots of time for Geo. Um, you also need to know exactly what you want. Yeah. Yeah. You also need to know exactly what you want with Geo. Johnny's gives you pictures, <laughs> which is why I like it. <laughs> But, but there's a lot of things you can't find at Johnny's because they just don't have that much all the time, so. And I will mention, uh, we, I told you, we'd tell you the secrets of how to grow seven foot tall dra uh, snapdragons. You have to put them in a pot. That's really all there is to it. Well, actually even the greenhouse or the Chinese greenhouse, because yeah. these won't get nearly that tall, but the ones in the Chinese greenhouse right now are like seriously crazy. crazy. Sometimes a little, I mean, there's a point at which it's really not that helpful. Yeah, no, actually, it's like. <laughs> but it's impressive. It's impressive. <laughs> it's, we yeah. By the foot, we yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, because you have to cut them twice. You've got to cut them down low because they're going to start branching where you cut them. So you've got to cut them low enough, and then you've got to cut them again to fit them in your bucket because otherwise they'll like fall out. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I'll point out is so snaps are a prime example of the different environments. So. You know, the ones in the um, Chinese greenhouse, which we actually planted in uh, December? Mm, uh, maybe November? Yes, it's after these. Well, I said that I had them there, but nobody yeah, could see them. They're only this small. <laughs> so we just transplanted those in the middle of March. So the snaps are one of those that we just keep successions all through the season. And while we have done them outside, we've mostly given up on that. I'm doing it a little bit more. Like, I just planted a little section of them outside. But, you know, flowers are so particular in terms of wind damage or hail or rain. I mean, even just a heavy rain. So, <laughs> so there is... There's yeah. a lot of value in putting um, simple structures over over flowers, and so this is a good example of. I mean, there's this is a super simple structure. It's just plastic and pipe. Um, it doesn't, you know, the doors obviously. Very fancy. Yeah, this isn't really <laughs> <laughs> top dollar. So this this is not a um, a very controlled environment, but they never get direct rain, and they get only the wind that we kind of allow, and that's really what makes the difference in the in flower quality in terms of uh, and you can you can control irrigation so i mean it's not getting direct rain but you're also controlling irrigation so which i don't know if we mentioned that on the ranunculus and the enemies but that's one of the things that kimby has taught me over the years is the ranunculus and enemies don't want nearly as much water as everything else i like no. watering things and uh, <laughs> she has to say no 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 they really don't no please don't and, uh, <laughs> About the third year that I killed half the ranunculus by overwatering them, she <laughs> reminded me again, and now we're doing better. It's <laughs> better. They still look sad and dry to me, but she's <laughs> But it is that is a, a real issue, and especially late winter. Um, and then and then there's a transition here where now we are watering the ranunculus as much as the other crops in there because they're big, they're big plants. But for so long, they're just these little forms. And if they sit there wet, they will rot. Yep, mm. I did that to half of mine. Yep. Yep. It was it's not fun. And the, and the anemones aren't a whole lot better. I, so. I, I think the they're same. kind of like the succulent flowers. Mm -hmm. They just don't. Oh. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. look at what you plant. True. Is that really alive? Are you sure? <laughs> right. There's little corn, there's little things that don't look at all alive before you soak them. And, yeah. So. But anyway, those, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, is, did I miss anything? Um, I don't Oh, we well, we have some peonies that, oh, we could. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever you want to do. I would say we do have the peonies outside the greenhouse. I have no idea what the peonies look like today. I have not looked at them. The ones outside the greenhouse look good. That's good. Uh, I don't know what the ones we'll, in the field look yeah, like. Yeah, we can mention peonies. We, you know, peonies are not a great Mother's Day flower, unfortunately. Not for us. If you're just a little further south, <sighs> then you're... Omaha, or even if you're in town, maybe. Yeah, up against a wall. Maybe in a tunnel. We've toyed with putting them in a tunnel. 
or some sort of temporary tunnel, but it's kind of hard to justify that right now. But a couple years ago, we got a deal on a bunch of, um, actually, Patrick was responsible for that, so we can blame him. <laughs> um, he found uh, like a, it was like a three-word ad in, uh, in some trader, farmer yeah, trader thing. Unexpected. Yeah, from Kansas, and it turned out to be this uh, 85-year-old lady in Kansas whose husband had passed away, and they had, I don't know how many hundreds of acres, but it turns out they had also three or four acres of peonies. And so she was selling them for, I think I paid, was it something silly? I think it was $5 a plant. Maybe it was even less than that. And they were, when we talk about plants, we're talking about bushel yeah. baskets. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we planted those last, last fall, uh, fall of 2019. So we had just a few blooms that last year, and then we're hoping for a good bloom this year. Um, but the only way that's going to work for Mother's Day is if we do some sort of... You would have to, for, for us, you would have to put them under a tunnel. Um, because they, we, we hit peony season for us like the last week in May. It's a Memorial Day flower. Yeah. And we sell them Great. all, but it's well, not like we don't sell them. It's just, but we <laughs> they're not for Mother's Day. day. That might be a problem. <laughs> so, um, I was thinking we could walk back up to the greenhouse and be in a summer environment and we can, like, I'll give you all the little pa papers and we can look at those. And then if you guys have suggestions or ideas too, we can talk about that. Oh, the only other questions. thing I'll mention is that Kimby and I are constantly, and this this is what this is one of those that falls more in my purview is farmscaping, and so we're trying to figure out perennials that we can put in our farm edges that then can be harvested, and so we've got, for example, right now the only thing we do with our fruit trees is harvest them, because we can't grow fruit it turns out <laughs> organically, but we can grow fruit blossoms. Yep. Boy, can we? And so we harvest the peach buds and we harvest the Not apple this year, buds but. Now the peaches were, didn't have buds this year, but no. the apples are lovely. And uh, crab apples and pears. Apples, we pears. We had some beautiful pears, pears this year that and, we stole. Uh, and then we're also looking into other woody perennials and woody, woody cuts that would fill that, hopefully, fill that greenery, that greenery hole in our hearts. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and, and twigs. I'm a big fan of twigs. Can be less so. I think the other part you haven't really talked about is the um, amount of labor it takes, which is an important thing when you're growing at this scale. Um, it's not just Kimby anymore, but there are multiple hands that come out and harvest daily, and even more as the summer goes on, in order to get this harvest into the cooler. Because it all has to be done in a very short time period when the weather's cool. So, um, Kimby yeah. is always on it, but there's a good Yep. Yep. Yeah, this is one of the nice things about growing this time of year is you actually have a sometimes all day. <laughs> sometimes I know because it's like oh I can but, uh, I can but harvest flowers in the. Our rule is we don't want to harvest above eighty, so that's in the, in the summer that means it's about sometimes no time. <laughs> sometimes it's dark, but uh, yeah, but you know just a couple hours usually in the morning. Yeah, the six eight in the morning. Cool. All right. So we'll we'll slowly make our way back up to the greenhouse, and if you guys have any more questions, or we can look over our our list too. This is a thornless raspberry. So you get lovely, delicious raspberries, but in the springtime, there's way too many of them, so they're great filler. So this was my Mother's Day filler last year. <laughs> this is what this was. They will get just a little bit taller, so it's easier to use. But um, and it looks like it has thorns, but it it doesn't really. Some of them actually are a little bit thorny, or even though they say they're thornless. Um, but yeah, and so they have to get they have to get thinned in the spring anyway. So it's like a really good win-win. I get lots of filler, and then we get yummy raspberries in the fall. So you can also cut them with berries on it if you're like, do, but Curtis won't let me do that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. You do have a line somewhere. Yeah. Are they the thornless red? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, these the are uh, thornless black. I think that's what I got. Yeah, these are all reds. These are all reds. There are some of these that are less yeah. thorny than others. Right. I think the least thorny that we have is the. Um, Aren't Joan Jay the least? Yeah, Joan Jay. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Jay. Which I think is yeah. this yeah. line. Here. But we have so we have Joan Jays and then we have. Um, Three Dutch varieties. I remember. I can never remember the names. Polana. And, or that's not right. They're not Polana. But uh, anyway, three fancy schmancy Dutch varieties. But the 
The Joan Jay also are some of the most vigorous growers. They send up, I mean, for, for every cane that we need, they probably send up 10. So there's a lot of filler. Yeah, so it's a lot of filler. You still get plenty of raspberries. But they do not do well out of tunnels. And you certainly wouldn't get Mother's Day canes without Without a tunnel. Them. Yeah, he'd have to tunnel them. And, and even out in the open. I mean, I guess, I don't know, we haven't tried to raise them out in the open that much. You did some before the farm. Yeah. They just, they don't like rain. <laughs> they don't normally like the They don't like anything. Yeah, yeah, they don't really like anything. So put a tunnel over them. Um, and you get to feed light and you can control well. the... Mm -hmm. Black red, uh, thornless blackberries do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you can use those for filler. Those are great. Yes, thornless. The thornless ones. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good idea. Yes. Thank you. So we uh, love to share what has been shared with us, and so uh, if there's something you know in the planning stuff that you're interested in. I know we, we will give you the heads up that what we will do is sort of vomit a word sh a spreadsheet at you mm -hmm. because that's how much spreadsheet there is. It's like uh, mm -hmm. 600 and some stupid entries. I mean, it's a ton of stuff. I deleted a lot of columns yeah. to print this. <laughs> There's no way to print this thing on less than like four pages across. So, uh, <laughs> and so we never do that. That's not what it's for. You know, we always sort and figure out what we're using it for yeah. and consolidate. But, uh, but as, a, as a very good friend says, a... Failure to plan is a plan to fail, and so one of the biggest things we've learned over the years is the, the more uh, we plan, the more success we have, and uh, you know that started with the vegetables, but if anything, the flowers are even more particular about having a solid plan because, uh, well, in part because you know vegetables, once they start producing, you kind of get to keep having them. That's not necessarily the case with all the flowers, right? So you have a kind of a target you're aiming for. Um, than having that plan and working it. And then the other thing that uh, we'll mention about a plan is, of course, the plan The plan has to be executed for it to be useful. Um, yeah. So that's, that's supposed to be my job, and so that's... But no, we, do, we actually do a, a pretty decent job anymore. Um, but along those lines, you cannot plan and execute at the same time, right? So we try and do all, most of our planning in November, December. Um, that allows us to do seed ordering, uh, one of the things that's really pushed us in flower farming is that you that's not really early enough for a lot of stuff. Um, so any of that stuff that's, you know, that August, September germinated and then transplanted out in the winter, we can't do that November, December plan. And yeah, I actually try times. I actually try and get my seeds for the following fall, like that fall. So, like, when, I, when we're making the plan in November, December, I'm trying to make sure that I have, like, all of my seeds, including the ones that I'm going to fall plant. Um, so, so, and sometimes I do, like, sometimes those will be out, or in some, uh, we frequently make a flower purchase in, like, June for seeds. Um, and then that's also true, I guess, most of you might really know this too, but it's like, it's like the idea of, like, basically when the flower is blooming, then that's pretty much the time you have to reorder it for next year. So, like, ranunculus and anemones, to reorder those, like, May, you know, you don't really want to wait later than May. <laughs> you want to order them in May. Um, if you want to choose what you get. If you want to choose what you get, yeah. <laughs> Fine. But, um, yeah, and I actually haven't, dahlias I think are similar. I actually haven't ordered dahlias in a long time. I just redo my tubers. But, um, yeah, that, that idea. Um, so this, I just put, what I did is, so I took, I took all of the crazy huge amount of spreadsheet and then I, I narrowed it down to just the flowers, and then I narrowed it further to the things that I, I seeded and planted this spring with the hope of them blooming in Mother's Day, and also the stuff that I seeded and planted last fall. Um, and so I, I grayed out the area that says harvest date for the fall planted ones, because that's basically an artifact of making it do what I want it to do. <laughs> So, spreadsheets don't like operating across the new year. Right, yeah. It's new years are confusing to them, and there's also like days of maturity and stuff. And so some of those days of maturity might not even be accurate. They might be. But um, those. that's why I kind of grade that out, because those are completely inaccurate, and they're not going to help you at all. 
<laughs> so, but the, the transplant date is fairly accurate. The seeding dates are accurate. And then I try to write in the right hand side, like kind of when I usually see those things blooming for me when I do them in the fall. Um, and then I do have a couple question marks because I've not done Scabiosia as a fall plant before, so I don't know. I'm hoping that they bloom soon, but <laughs> I don't know if they will or not. What's this acronym here? The CGH. Uh -huh. That's the Chinese greenhouse. Oh. Yeah. Or the greenhouse. Yeah. So. Yeah, so that column is where we're yeah. planting. I saw those when I came in. There was a bucket of them. The oh, yeah, the Syrinth. Yes. Yeah. Like yeah. So I've never seen one in real life. Yeah, they're, they're really fun. Uh, they won't quite get that tall in the field, but they will get they will get pretty tall. Like, they get nice. They're still nice in the field. I'll lower my expectations. Yeah. <laughs> they're beautiful. Um, Next video. How yeah. do you get six foot tall, Sarah? <laughs> you don't. You don't. Um, yeah, we actually had some in here in the bed where the basil is last year, and it seriously was like five feet tall. It was, wow. it was dangerously right large. Do they need like? Um, mm. No, okay. I mean not when they're that big. I, in the field, I don't trellis them, but okay. in here they well there was also anyway there was we also dahlias. We tr they tried like to be trellis. Sort of then thing. we like <laughs> hacked them off because they were like <laughs> spilling out into the. It was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, honeywort. honeywort. Syrinth, I think is how you say it. I'm not sure. Some of these words I don't... Yeah, I read them. I don't... I know. I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so the stock that I thought for me, um, this stock that's on here is actually blooming right now, although my target date is May 6th. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's a good example of those target dates not being exactly accurate. Um, but that's based on days of maturity, and it could be that my so I split my days of maturity and then the seedling days of maturity up um, because it gets kind of it's that's a little bit of a guess. But the seedling days of maturity is kind of like how long you want it to be in your soil block or whatever before you transplant it out. And so something like a zinnia or a sunflower is like two to three weeks. Well, sunflower is like two weeks. Zinnias are like three weeks. But then um, other things like stock, I have 56 days which is fairly accurate. They're kind of slow, um, especially, this time, of especially this time of year. Yeah, um, snapdragons are also pretty slow. But they might, the stock might be ahead because this year we had really good success with our heated seedling table. And yes. the stock, we kind of left the stock on the heating seedling table. <laughs> I think Perhaps I, a little longer than we should have. Yeah. We were very, very happy. Very big, yeah. And usually we transplant out stock and these were like Oh wow! Yeah, so and and stock is actually something that I want to learn a lot more of because I think there's there's something that I can they're they're a once cut thing so in some ways they're kind of a they're kind of frustrating because you spend a lot of time putting them out there and then you cut them and they're done, mm -hmm. um, but I want to I want to try and figure out how to squish them more together. I think I'm giving them too much space. Like I don't think they need that much space. So, but anyway. And I want to direct you. But I had a stem no. of stock. <laughs> no, I had a stem of stock from you that I had in my kitchen for like three weeks. And yeah. The yeah. So, I mean, they might not grow back, but they're a great <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they do. Yeah. And they smell. And I think that the more, stock more could be a really good florist crop. Yes. When I buy kidney stock, it lasts three weeks. Yes, when I buy the stuff amazing. from the wholesaler, usually after five days, it looks. Oh, really? It's That's probably already been alive multiple weeks. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Or, or dying multiple weeks, crops, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck with from the wholesaler, but that's one. That that's one that you don't. Just doesn't compare. Doesn't well. yeah. Interesting. Well, there we yeah. go. Yeah. Stock. Oh. Which is a brassica. It is. Which is kind if of you need to know that it is actually a problem. But we don't. So stock likes it cold, um, and so it when it gets hot, it starts getting real, real short. And so you can plant it, but then it's going to bloom, and it's going to be like this big. Um, so we don't plant it. Like I've already planted my last stock. I won't be planting anymore. Um, Rattle stock. Rattle stock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, yeah. So larkspur, I planted. I they're really far behind this year, so I don't think I'm gonna have them blooming by May 10th, unfortunately. Um, you can also overwinter those, and you can direct seed those. You can direct seed larkspur. I'm in. I'm it also will self-seed. Yeah. But it's, uh, no, it's a fall plant, right? So it's a fall plant. That in 
August, September, whenever. Yeah, I think like more than maybe November, but I'm not sure. But um, it also last freeze. It'll um, it will self seed, which is great. First, last freeze, first freeze. First freeze. Okay. Sorry, yeah, that's okay. That's what I thought the, you meant. Of the fall season, yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it will self seed very readily. So we actually have a bed and a half out there of volunteer larkspur that we keep covering up right now because it may be nice, but the problem for us is that we rotate things around, and so we don't actually want larkspur there this year. <laughs> we're learning here. We're we're trying to figure out. So speaking, we were talking about perennials earlier. Our our long term goal with a lot of these perennials would be that we can find a place where they can just be. This is the larkspur bed, and maybe we renovate it every few years and switch it up, but we don't have to. Right now, what we're dealing with a lot is that these, you know, and it's a new thing, because being originally vegetable growers, you don't let vegetables grow to seed. Like, you, yeah. you failed. If you're there <laughs> to seed, you didn't do that right. And so we've never really had that as a problem. And now, of course, every time we grow Orlea or every time we grow... Bachelor's buttons. Bachelor's and, yeah. and even the basils, and so, I mean, we have carpets of basil in our mm -hmm. tunnels. And so we're trying to figure this out as to how, how do we walk that line? Because they are great crops and we definitely want to have them, but we also have, when we rotate, you know, a bed of head lettuce into something that's going to pop up or lay all over the place, it's like, that, that's not ideal. No. So that's how we're trying to figure it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, does anybody have... That's where that extra five acres you used to plot. <laughs> I know, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> this is the Larkspur plot. <laughs> well, I thought you already had that. you got to have, you know, use that for something else. Yeah, that's right. We're going to need more land. <laughs> no. So is there, is there any questions anybody has? Kimmy, Sarah alluded to staff size, and then can you kind of summarize what that is, what time of year they come out, and then kind of what days of the week they have what jobs and how they're accomplished. Sure. So what what we do is I harvest flowers until I get overwhelmed, <laughs> and then I go, I can't do this anymore. It's about the first of March this Which year. is about the first of March, yeah. Um, so we have, uh, I have one person right now who is working um, about three mornings a week. Uh, roughly two to four hours every time she comes out, um, depending a little bit on what we have and what her schedule allows. And so she's helping me harvest. And then every once in a while, I'll be like, Janae, please go harvest the whatever. Um, and I'm trying not to, to make Janae or Carissa like, harvest a ton right now because I'm going to need them more in the summer when it gets really crazy and we have two hours in which to harvest. And so um, usually in May, we start... Um, yeah, usually in May we start 6 a.m. harvest, and so we'll harvest from 6 to 8 roughly or 6 to 9, depending on the weather. Um, and then at that point, it's usually three or four of us who are harvesting that, because that's the only time we have to harvest it. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that's, that's harvest. We try and make bouquets. So Farmer's Market is a big outlet for us. And um, we try and make bouquets for Farmer's Market. It's just on a Saturday. We actually make those on a Thursday. We were making them on Fridays in the early part of the season. But what also happens is we're also balancing, um, like, Farmer's Market vegetables. And we're also packing a bunch of shares for vegetable shares and stuff, too. And so a lot of that happens on Friday. So Friday ends up being a really crazy day. So we've learned that if we can do bouquets on Thursday, everybody is much happier. So we do bouquets on Thursday, and we get them in the cooler, and then they go to market on, on Saturday. And then a lot of times, once CSA starts, we'll also do CSA bouquets as part of that. People can choose that as an option with their vegetables. And so that's a Tuesday. So I end up having like a large amount of flowers that go out on Tuesday and a large amount of flowers that go out on Friday, Saturday. Um, and then I also have a bunch of um, florists who come through and get some things like Rebecca and, and I was like Mountain Flower Truck and just different people um, have different levels of need for that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what, and those things are all handled. I handle all those as far as interacting with, with florists and customers and stuff. Um, um, and the, the, the thing to mention is we have Chelsea who was in here arranging. Yeah. She comes in every Thursday and does, she's, she is the 
head arranger, so to speak. Yeah. So because what we realized after not very many years of flowers was that, um, I mean, Kimby and I were already really busy. <laughs> It really wasn't. It really wasn't working for her to be the flower arranger as well. I can so do it, but she's it's great at it. Better, but if, if she if she can say <laughs> this is what we have, and or she, I mean, Chelsea's great. You really even have to say she can say these are off limits. Everything else goes, and and then we just kind of let it roll, and then people can step in, and she can coach them how to do this and make you know make this bouquet or make the big ones, small ones, whatever. Um, but as long as she's the head responsible person. And uh, she's very diligent. She's relatively quick. It's gotten a lot quicker, actually, over the last couple of years. Um, We've learned is, things about that. <laughs> really a big deal because you can take 30 minutes to make a, a market bouquet or you can take five minutes to make a market bouquet. And the difference is really uh, is, is not your money. Quality, it's profit. It's money, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you, I mean, we so. are trying to keep the roof overhead and the land underfoot. So. Right, and so, Chelsea is a designer. I mean, like that's what she does, and so you can. See, she was working on. A, she has a big wedding this weekend, so, and like if anybody peeks her head in the cooler, which are more than welcome to look in the flower cooler, like the, some of that stuff is not mine. Some of that is from the wholesaler. <laughs> so if you're like, how did you get that? That's because it's from the wholesaler. Like I don't grow roses. <laughs> Those are not mine. <laughs> Do what? Right, right. Yeah, yeah the hydrangeas. No, not mine. This is on our list of things we want to grow. But, but we still wouldn't have them now. Yeah, exactly. So. That's what I knew. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and so she, you know, she's using a lot of our flowers as well, but she also does. And we let her do this because she's amazing. And we should mention and that the helps. cooler is a huge part of our workflow, too. Because oh, yeah. Without a cooler, you don't really have a workflow with flowers. You know, you harvest and sell. <laughs> Here they are. So, but the cooler makes the whole difference. And, and so that's part of the thing of harvesting. You know, obviously the flowers survive hot temperatures. But if you harvest them and then they experience those hot temperatures, their, their base life goes down really fast. Yep. And then some things, and this has been an interesting learning curve for both of us because uh, we the condition thing. So you know, there's a lot of things that, that you can harvest and they'll make great cuts, but they need to go into the cooler for a certain amount of time. Or sometimes they need to sit at room temperature for a certain amount of time. So there's a lot of learning curve there. And, and But having the proper storage, having the ability to do that, and then the proper... Um, solutions as well. So with the sarin, I've read that that droops really easily. Do yes. Do you guys do any treatment to the stems? There's there's a there's a special dance that you have to do. <laughs> there's some incantation incantations that you have to make while you're. Um, what I have found that works the most, and I'm constantly changing on this, but what I have found that works the most um, is best is I cut the stems, put them directly into like a quick dip or an easy dip solution, and put them in the bucket and put them in the warm cooler. Um, they can handle a cold cooler, but they don't seem to like coming, they don't like to change temperatures. Exactly. So like if they're in the cold cooler and you bring them out here to arrange with them and they get warm, then they get droopy. And then like, but then once they, once they rehydrate at that temperature, then they're fine. But then they, so they, they don't like going in and out. So when I have them not arranged, then they're in the warm room and I bring them out here, we'll arrange them and then we'll put them in the cooler. And then they're usually, they're most of the time fine. Okay. They don't do well, like they're not the best filler if you're gonna like have a really outside wedding where right. things are really exposed, I wouldn't use them. If they are sitting, honestly, at a, at a farmer's market stand out in the blazing sun, they're also not, I have not had good luck with them. However, they will last forever in a vase in your house. Yeah. Like, they're just, it, once yeah. they're hydrated, they're just wonderful. Right. Sierra, yeah. or honeywort. Honey honey yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. The so other thing the, we learned how, along what is this the, okay. was to keep them hydrated. So right. we had some in a raised bed here one time that were really not, we didn't realize how dry they were getting, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and we kept, they just kept wilting. Well, what's wrong with these? Because you oh, were watering the ranunculus anemones they're, instead. Yeah, because I was like, the flowers don't want water. <laughs> um, but they can, they feel like a succulent. You know, yeah. they're so, so you don't pick up on it that so they pretty. are so um, cool. They really like um, a lot of water. Need more water. Yeah. So the warm cooler, what is that? Like About your 55, 60. Okay, good information. Thank you. Yeah. And our cold cooler is 34. Ideally. Awesome. Ish. Ish. Which is a little cold for dahlias, um, and too cold for zinnias and basil. <laughs> but, let's see, did we get the schedule then? So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is currently when Sarah's coming out. To no, come. actually, she comes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because we yeah. load up the cooler. Thursday, we arrange. Friday, we sell. Friday, Saturday, we sell. Yeah. And then it starts, well, but it, it, 
it should also be pointed out that Kimby harvests. I'm harvesting every Saturday day. And yeah. And I mean, there, there's some things that if you wait, they're just not going to be. Yeah, like right. this this time of year, you've got to harvest ranunculus every day, or you're going to have Silly things. really exploded ranunculus, yeah. which are beautiful but don't last. So. And there is a lot to learn that I don't know, but Kimby definitely knows about when, you know, stage of openness. That's a big deal. So yeah. you, you wait too long, they don't last. If you open it, cut them too soon, they won't open, and so on. So. And that changes a lot on who your market is right. as well. Yeah. So. yeah, since ours is a market bouquet, we, you know, we're not trying to sell stuff to a florist that's going to sit in their cooler for two weeks before it goes out the door. Mm -hmm. We are, we want things to be yeah. beautiful and, and in bloom when we sell them on Saturday. So we right. Don't, we well, and we're not shipping at all, and right. so that changes when you harvest. So a lot of your recommendations of like that in the books that tell you when to harvest things, a lot of that, I'm not all of it, but a lot of that is kind of like giving you the earliest possible that you could harvest it, especially if you're going to ship it. Mm -hmm. um, but I also I find that I like to back off that just a little bit and let things open a little bit more, with the exception of peonies. But <laughs> so all that to say, if you're going to pick them, and tulips, prime, <laughs> I don't grow tulips. <laughs> <laughs> we don't grow tulips. We don't grow tulips. I'm not going to do it. Um, you all should grow tulips, and they're beautiful, and they're wonderful. But Why not? You can grow them. I think it's wasteful. Pull those little bulbs up, cut their tops off, throw them away. Cool. Yeah, because you, if you're, if you're going to grow them for cuts, then you, you've got to pull the whole bulb out, and they store forever. But, um, yeah, you're, it's, a, it's kind of a... a decently large investment. Um, so if something well, goes wrong, five cents a bulb, I think we decided it's basically. kind of, it's a little sketchy. And, um, and they're just a one flower a one thing. Shot. Yeah, that's the other objection right. I have is I, I'm not a big fan of one cuts, with stock being maybe the exception. But, um, and this is one of the push pulls that Kimby and I exert on one another is, I'm a big fan of multi-cut anything. Anything you can plant yep. and tend once and cut it twice. Like zinnias times are amazing. Is. But then she will point out that, you know, yeah, zinnias are amazing until they aren't. And then there's this yeah. time when you're like clinging to these sort of uh, powdery mildew in. <laughs> well, why are we still doing these? Um, and so there, that's one of the advantages of single cut is you can go out and you can clean the bed out and we start over. So yeah. there's, it, it, we both see the advantage to both directions. But, uh, but it's one of those kind of tensions that we keep is uh, trying to figure out where do we go between um, those two things. And so... Uh, this is my first year growing tulips, and I ordered them when I thought, I can grow them again and again, and I was so excited, and then I was reading in the books, and I'm like, you do what now? <laughs> <laughs> you ask for them? Okay. So my rainbow tulips that were like 14 cents each, I pulled, mm -hmm. but with the intention of knowing that I'm not going to do it again next year. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, when I realized that's how it is. But some of the fancies that got tall enough, I left two leaves on them, and I'm hopeful maybe someday they'll come back. back. You never know. I mean, they might not be as nice, but they're still pretty. Well, and our friends who do a lot of tulips, they will take the bulbs and stick them in there, like just toss yeah. them out and, and cover them over. Lilies the same way. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they don't ever try. expect to cut them again. They're just using this Pretty. landscape. That sure. Moment, so. yeah. And that depends on how you're selling the tulips, of course. And there comes a threshold with that, too. You can't and just have a yard full of... Oh, we got five acres over here. I'm <laughs> ready to spread <laughs> bulbs. Um, the only one that we are doing that way is lilies. Well, we've, we've played with a couple different bulbs over the years. We did the Dutch iris, which never really quite worked out the way we hoped they would. Um, and then the... They're um, fine. Well, the, they just... The, we kept having... I always wanted Dutch green. iris for Mother's Day, yeah. Yeah. and they were always earlier than that. Yeah. The so, ones in the field never worked for me, and the ones in the greenhouse were beautiful, but they were March yeah. or April. Yeah. They, um, were lovely, but they, they were lovely, they just... Uh, and then uh, we've messed with... Uh, so this is our first year doing lilies, and I, they look like they're going to maybe hit Mother's maybe. Day, but we don't have enough experience to know that for sure. They've got little buds on about that long. They look really good. And they're growing really fast. So like, <laughs> maybe. <the> pep talk. <laughs> anyway, so we've kind of backed away from bulbs in general, but we kind of like the lily thing. Maybe we'll see. Actually, maybe I was we'll pushing see. for lilies. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So right. go for it. Have you guys tried columbines? Mine look like they might bloom for Mother's Day. Just grab them. No. <laughs> I'm having a hard time imagining how you get a long enough stem on a columbine. It's, like, it's cool, though. The variety I bought, the stems are about this tall, and they have little buds on them, so I think in the next week or two they're going to pop, so they'll be long enough. Those are cool. Yeah, we bought a bunch of columbine at auction this year. We might try and put some out that way, but yeah, we haven't. 
Do you have them? Where did you plant them? Are they in the shade? Um, are they? No, they're just kind of out there in the field. Yeah. Cool. So it's not. Yeah, you're not going towards the shade. But um, I'm trying to think what um, varieties. I think I got a Barlow and a pink petticoat. Those are cute. Cool. So maybe I may have missed it, but uh, what about foliage? Oh, what about that? <laughs> so, if the florist comes and asks her what foliage she has, she always says no. No, no, I have none. Um, so I, I have enough foliage this time of year for some mixed bouquets at market, and that's pretty much it. So um, that's something that, that's, well, so the Syrinth in the Chinese greenhouse is my foliage right now. Um, and right now, I can also harvest the honeysuckle, the invasive bush that's all over the, I, yeah, it's a good use for it. Yep. Uh, Get the roots. Um, autumn olives, we've used that at times. Autumn olives this, this time of year. I did mention, so I, I wrote, like, this little list down here are things that I've had the last couple years for Mother's Day that aren't necessarily on this list. Um, so ranunculus and anemones, like most of mine are, are pretty much, the ranunculus are pretty done by Mother's Day, but I usually get a few. The anemones are also on the way out. Pennycress, um, we have a bunch of wild pennycress that is gorgeous and I love it. Um, it's the weeds, yeah. yeah. Um, but we harvest those. Um, the raspberries are used as greenery. We use autumn olive. Um, that's also a slight, I think it's also an invasive. But it's here, uh, so we use it. Yeah, so the, and then the honeysuckle bush, it starts fairly early. Like we could have, I think, used it about two weeks ago. Um, I do get zinnias in the high tunnel. They are not on the list. So I'm not quite sure why, but um, I think because their harvest date is actually quite a bit later, but I usually always get them for Mother's Day. Um, with Julia, might not be saying that right. It's a flowering bush. And so it usually flowers right around Mother's Day. So we've been using that. Bolted cilantro. So bolted parsley and bolted cilantro is something that I use for filler all the time. You do have to wait until it flowers. If you use it before that, it will not hold up. Um, and then, yeah. Um, dahlias. I have dahlias that over winter, we don't dig them. We plant, keep them in the greenhouse. And so sometimes I get a few dahlias for Mother's Day, but not enough to like say I have dahlias for Mother's Day. No. Yeah. One just, year we did. We did a heated bed. And we yeah, one year we had them. Really worked hard to make them, and they were actually pretty decent that year. But then they yeah. died off early too because it, they'd been they got powdery mildew and yeah. other things. It's, they, yeah, the early dahlias will also be done earlier than mm -hmm. the outside ones will. Mm -hmm. um, it's really willow, and I really like the little baby leaves on that in the spring. I don't like the way it looks when the leaves get big. I think they look kind of messy. But early in the spring, up until about now, they look really nice. They I think we have some curly willow that has got six in a pot. I keep hung out to plant them, for a while. I found a place to plant them. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I do have like Five acres. the eucalyptus tree in the back, um, and I will harvest on that like through the winter. But I don't. It's not. A, it's only one tree, so it's not enough to really get significant greenery off of. I oh, when we use nasturtiums as well, the crazy nasturtium bush, mm -hmm. it it has these little shoots, and so we'll use those as filler, and that works really well. Are we talking about raspberries? Yeah. We cut out of the raspberries uh, this time of now, year. Now, yeah. And um, we have, uh, there's another one. Oh, so we're planting some nine bark and things yeah. like that. We're not sure when those are going to hit. That might be in this time frame. They're, they're green right now, so we're looking at them going, well, that might work. They're yeah. little. They'd be like the, the mini. They have to get woody before they'll hold up to it. Oh, yeah. I use a lot of this crab apple that's right here. Um, you can, they, they start, like they look like little red balls. You can harvest them at that point and they'll, they'll also continue to open. Once they get that, I mean, that's also frost damage now, so. Yeah. <laughs> it was beautiful. It wasn't brown yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> but um, I, don't, I don't use it when it's that full because then it starts shedding all over the place, yeah. but. I noticed that with the Brad, we have Bradford's all in our field and we're hacking those things out along with the honeysuckle. But I'm using it for filler too. But yeah. the leaves or the petals just fall Yeah, off. they fall all over the place. Privets are usually ready. What, what is? Privets are usually Privets, yeah. Yeah, we do have yeah. a privet. Yeah. Like They're also invasive. You yeah. Says, You're not allowed, Curtis. We just use the one we have. We're not going to propagate it. We also use Johnson grass as a filler. No. Right. We don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we can only use Bermuda. This is what I'm doing. That's right. Uh, <laughs> what, what? Yeah, 
I have used cedar. Um, I used cedar during um, during Valentine's Day with because all I had really were anemones, and so I had anemones and cedar, and they were very a very wintry. It was really pretty. I liked it a lot. So yeah, you can use cedar. It's a little prickly. It's not my favorite. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah. One of the things I that, that we're some working of the on. Bushes are more prickly than others. Yeah. We have several on our property that aren't prickly at all, exactly and some right. that are deadly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and so there also are also vary a lot. Some different. They're not actually cedars, I guess, but the flat. So I've got on my Perfect. list several things to try, but one of them is those flat. Um, arborvitae. I guess that arborvitae, but it's a. It's a lot like a. Cedar. It's an evergreen. Yeah. yeah. It can be what percentage of your operation right now is. Um, flowers. And, and how did that change from when you started? And, and what inspired the... That's a whole conversation, yeah. Mike. <laughs> what, what, what inspired that focus? I don't know what the percentage is. Do you know what the well, percentage is? Well, um, let's see. When we started, of course, it was zero. And um, and, and I can give you just the, the littlest... I'll try and tell the very shortest story of that, but when we started flowers, we really weren't, we were just vegetable growers. I'd always said, if you can't eat it, I'm not interested in growing it, because then if we don't sell it, we can eat it. We do do um, edible flowers, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we have those as well. Counts. They I barely mean, count. But Nobody eats a snapdragon because they're hungry. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I actually did try it. It was horrible. Oh, they're horrible. Pretty rough. Ever. You would not want to eat that hungry. Oh, my God. My kids love nasturtiums, which is also oh, yeah. kind of messed up, but they're, um, they're really <laughs> No, they're good. They're good, no. compared to a snapdragon. Like aspirin. Yeah. <laughs> It might be. It might be aspirin. No, we. Yeah, I've, if you take I've the tried green them. off the back, the calyx. Oh, I bet that's what I. Yeah. But it doesn't help that much. Oh. They're still not good. They're still better. Yeah, they're just better. They just less won't kill you if you put them on a cake. Wait, which is so, more bitter, snapdragons or nasturtiums? Both. Well, snapdragons are hot. The um, spice. I'm sorry, no, the way around. Nasturtiums, nasturtiums are hot. Nasturtiums are hot. Snaps, snaps are bitter. I mean, anything gets better with olive oil on it. Um, so, so we said no. You know, I always said no. We're not. We're not flower growers. And it wasn't really an intentional choice as much as it was just like, well, we're not. That's not what we're doing. We're growing food, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and this is the way I remember this story. So take it for what it's worth, right? But but uh, one week, uh, this was a, a Friday. Sarah and I were out harvesting. And getting ready to go to early spring market. When it, when it early spring? I don't know when it was. Some midsummer maybe. But we had big CSA, and so we really didn't have much to take to market. And we had you know, radishes and head lettuce or something, and and not that much of either one of those. And we like to have a big full table, right? You go to market, pile it high, watch it fly, and, it, and that's that's the rule. And so uh, she said, "What about these marigolds and zinnias that you always grow?" Because I'd always been you know, raised in a family garden. We always raised a row of zinnias and marigolds at the end of the rows and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I said, "Oh, you know." Those are just garden flowers. Like nobody, nobody wants to buy those. And she said, "Well, maybe you know, it filled the table." I said, oh, "Okay." So, so she harvested some bundles of zinnias and, and marigolds and made some bouquets. And and you know, so there we are at the table the next morning with our beautiful pile of radishes and our head lettuce and our little flower arrangements. And and uh, you know, this couple walks in with their five dollar coffees and the three dollar donuts, and they they look down at our two dollar and fifty cent radishes and go. <laughs> Two dollars and fifty cents. How much are the bouquets? And Twelve dollars. <laughs> we'll take two. And, oh! <laughs> right, this game at all. So, uh, so at that point, right, you can you can get mad or you can grow more flowers. And so uh, that was kind of the tipping point on saying, okay, well we can do this. So from there, and then the, that following year. We got to know Mark Kane of Dripping Springs Farm. Mark and Michael at Dripping Springs Farms are probably, the, I would say, the most accomplished flower growers in our region. They really know their stuff, and they've been doing it for 35 years. And they started with a blueberry farm, and they figured out pretty quickly that flowers make a lot more money than blueberries. <laughs> and they grow vegetables because they have the same thing, like we need to be able to eat the stuff we grow. Mm -hmm. But Mike told uh, um, Mark, we went, uh, Mark. Kimby and I went to a conference out in Lexington, I think is where that was. And did a two-day meet with them uh, and and Alex Hit from um, Peregrine Peregrine yeah Peregrine, Peregrine Farms, Farms down in South Carolina or North Carolina somewhere anyway, North down there one of the Carolinas and uh, and both of them do a lot of vegetables and flowers together side by side and both of their numbers were um, essentially in the field the flowers were 50 percent of the space and the vegetables were 50 percent of the space. 
but sales wise it was more like 60 40. Yeah. so the flowers were selling right. out profiting a lot more you know profit might not be the right word but they are producing more revenue per square foot yeah um and so that was another kind of like oh, okay well we we need to figure out how to do this better because um ultimately you know dollars per square foot is what most of our since we're on a two acre postage stamp garden um then that's really what matters to us almost as much as anything is dollars per square foot so that pushed us so that first year i don't know we I mean, we sold a couple thousand dollars worth of flowers and uh, and it was mostly the really easy stuff i mean zinnias marigolds um that's just button snaps snaps yeah. snaps still amaze me yeah they're just so and then um i feel like there was one more that was really big that year but i don't know what it, what it would have been but anyway that's Oh, probably bachelor's buttons. Yeah. <laughs> There's sort of a weed, really, but um, so we those, but those that was enough promise to go. Wow, this is interesting. And then, then um, Kimmy kind of caught the bug, and it was like, oh, look at all these. You know, you look in the catalog. Oh, well, then so I looked at Johnny's yeah. and all the pictures. <laughs> Dangerous. Yeah. All those shapes and textures. Exactly. No, it's it's safer. So, yeah. Next year, only GOC. <laughs> um, is so, that what keeps you from doing more perennials is you don't get the dollar per square foot because they just so once what's kept there. us from doing perennials is we do Weeds. really good planning in november but that's kind of where it ends and then we're not really good at <laughs> planning and thinking things so yeah it's just we haven't really and well and until real recently we were doing a lot of shuffling all the time where things were going and so on we're, i feel like we're getting to the point now where we're starting to figure out where perennials can be oh and the other thing that keeps us from doing perennials is bermuda uh, Bermuda grass. So Bermuda, and to some degree Johnson grass, but Bermuda more. So, uh, so, the, so from that's five or six years ago. That was pretty much zero sales on vegetable on flowers, and uh, and last year, I don't know what we have last year's numbers. The year before it was. The year before it was ten thousand dollars at market, and then around eight to nine thousand dollars at CSA, and around eight thousand dollars wholesale. So. You know, a little less than thirty grand um, out of a total farm. Well, not including pizza night, because um, that really is its own endeavor. But the growing vegetables and 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 flower sales from our farm, our fields, was a little under um, two hundred thousand. So, and so it's that's, also like, I mean, I would say two years ago we were at eleven beds, and we have a, there are hundred foot beds. Um, I think I'm more than that now. Yes, a lot more. But it was 11 beds, yeah. like through the, like some of those beds got reused, so I'm not sure that Absolutely. you could even count, like it would be probably more like 20 yeah. if you were looking at it just like one time use um, type thing. But like that would be, that was like 11 beds out of all um, of, how many do we have roughly? 140. About 140. So. Yeah. so about 10%. So it was holding its own very well. I mean, it was, if you look at the percentage in that, in that crop, it was outperforming the vegetables as a whole. And that's still the case. Um, so now I think, my, I mean, just guessing, I would say last year we probably sold 50000 to $60,000 worth of flowers. And that's, I mean, that's not exactly just a guess. It's definitely thinking about how things worked in general. Do you guys and, grow enough of the demand that you have? No. Now, market demand, market we demand that is pretty closely this time of year, but it, it yeah. does this, and it's hard to predict. Yeah, I think um, demand-wise also, I would say, you know, we have not touched florists, I mean, other than just a couple of individuals, and we yeah. don't really want to necessarily, but there obviously is an increase in demand there. Um, well, and like, the other thing is, is like, you know, flor flowers are very seasonal and holiday specific, um, yeah. and that's actually really hard because a lot of your really floral heavy holidays are early. I mean, like we're talking about Mother's Day. I mean, Mother's Day is really hard to hit well here. Um, and so, like, that's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, like, weddings, you have spring weddings and you have fall weddings, and, like, you know, I don't know. I, n nobody gets married in July when there's all the flowers. <laughs> so if you want to do a sunflower wedding, man, can we July. Set them up? I mean, <laughs> if you exceed that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> As a florist, for example, I have a wedding every weekend in May, every weekend in June, and then just one at the beginning of July. And then none the rest of July, none in August, none until the last week of September. 
And then I have one every weekend in October and the first two weekends in November. Wow. It's an interesting pattern. <laughs> and it is very challenging to grow flowers yeah. for. But so the answer is there's still demand. Definitely. I mean just and, and the same thing we tell people with vegetables too. I really believe, you know, we are we are a tiny farm. I mean, we feel big to ourselves sometimes when we're out there trying to harvest all these vegetables and flowers. But really, two acres, you know, and, and we sell our vegetables and flowers to uh, really a population of maybe maybe 1,200, maybe 2,000 people or probably consume 90% of what we produce. And we live in a metro area of 400,000 people. So there's room for 100 more farms like us around Springfield. So we and never like, worry about competition. Yeah, and yeah. You mentioned the flower farmer up north that actually drives into Kansas City True. and goes door to door yeah. to flower shops mm -hmm. and he has an empty truck by the time he leaves. Yeah. He doesn't have anything yeah. pre-sold before he goes. He just brings beautiful yeah. buckets full of flowers and walks up to their door and they know when he's coming. <laughs> and they're really excited to see him and they buy him out. I mean, he's got a waiting list to get on his on his delivery route, and, and if he runs out before he gets to the last couple of people, he gets angry phone calls. <laughs> You're not coming to see me this week. Market, and then, like the, the flower, the mountain sweat girls. Uh huh. Um, they're they're really yeah. Really well, and then CSA. So our CSA bouquets, like we usually make about twenty five mm -hmm. a week for months. like bouquets, large bouquets for for CSA on Tuesdays. Um, and then we make about that much large bouquets for market, and then we make small bouquets. Small bouquets are like everything that, um, well, because like you have to harvest things in the field, whether they, I mean, you don't have to, I guess, but I like to harvest things in the field if they're blooming to get them out of my way, whether they're going to be marketable, like whether they're marketable stems, like whether I would sell it to Rebecca, be like, no, I'm not going to sell that one to Rebecca, but I will use it in a small bouquet. Um, because our small bouquets are like everything that's left over at the end, and we just kind of like throw things together. And they work great. You can talk over them. It, the dinner. Exactly. <laughs> and they're cheaper, and people love them at market. Mm -hmm. That's how you sell them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. These are bouquets so. if you like your family. Yes. <laughs> if you like each other. <laughs> so, and then we also do like straight stem stuff if we have a lot of it. So, like, when we have tons of sunflowers, we'll do sunflower bouquets, and we'll like sometimes we'll throw a little bit of status in there. But um, we do a lot of that too. And that like the different price points help a lot. Um, Last week we did a ranunculus flash sale. Yeah, because I have so many ranunculus. So, pretty. so. And they were gorgeous. And that and sold it. really well. Yeah. Then yeah. we sold a thousand dollars of ranunculus in like two and, and two a half days. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So pretty. So I don't think we can do that every week. You know, that's that's the nature of these things. Right. So, but but if they weren't blooming like that for you every week either. No. So perfect. So we did. It works. Do you usually sell with the container or without? Without. I do, we do hand-tied bouquets, so, um, which means we're not arranging, um, which was something that, like, Chelsea, who was arranging here for weddings, like, that was her background, was to arrange and, and design, and so that's something that we've worked with on hers, to be like, we're not arranging this. I mean, she still makes them beautiful. Yeah, so they're arranged, so it's basically but, arranged to... So that you, can, that you can wrap it into a, yeah, and we put a, we use brown craft paper and wrap them in a brown craft paper, um, and then that way they, and that's really important so you can see them at market because we'll have like five bouquets in a bucket. So you got to be able to see what is what. So it keeps the flowers protected. It does a little bit. I, we do a lot of one side. So, yeah. and this so is something, we, so we do right. both. We'll do a circle bouquet, like a circle around one, but those are more often um, for us and the way that we utilize our flowers, like those, don't work as well for us we do like a tall to short like one-sided yeah. kind of bouquet and so then the flowers kind of the paper kind of wraps around it like a jacket right. and it doesn't necessarily wrap necessarily. around it to to keep it oh, protected yeah. Yeah. it just more separates it from each other i mean they do, it does a little it bit it. yeah it yeah. catches from some catch, holding hands yeah. they don't hold hands as well when they <laughs> are wrapped in paper so. so what are your biggest challenges to scaling up and yeah. if you know there's demand well, labor Sanity. <laughs> <laughs> labor, labor is really the biggest thing. One of the um, things that Kimby and I talk about all the time is how do we find people who understand the dollar to time scenario? I mean, you know, no farmer gets paid for just being here, right? So it's got it's every every stem that's picked, every potato that's dug. <laughs> uh, however long it takes you to do that, that's what you're getting paid for that time. So. Um, that's a tough one. I mean, honestly, I'm not. I just don't know that. 
we, we haven't figured out a really good way to teach that. That seems like something that people are either kind of, maybe it's the way they're raised, or maybe it's just their cult, I mean, I don't know what it is, but, but uh, moving fast is a rare skill. Moving fast with accuracy, right? Yeah. And, um, and so that's one big challenge for us is finding those people. I mean, if we had, we've actually even had the conversation about uh, doing something like the H2A program, which is a, a, a guys coming up, guys and gals coming up from um, Central and South America to work seasonally because uh, our friends who have done that, just that's exactly what they get. People who understand accuracy, speed, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and understand that the job's not done until the whole job is done. So it's, yeah. that's complicated. So that would be one thing is labor. Um, square footage is an issue. I mean, we only have two acres that are tillable. We now have a lot more land. We can be just bought 30 acres behind us. So that may, that'll take that off the table. And that is right now. We're but that doesn't mean that. we want to actually use all of that. Right. <laughs> because we still have the labor issue. So the part of the question there is that's where the perennials are kind of interesting. Is like, here's something we can establish. And the work of establishment only has to be done once. And then we're, then we're maybe doing pruning and, and care. But that's usually a lot less than like going out and renovating the field completely and mm -hmm. turning it into something completely different. So, mm -hmm. so that's our hope for that. Um, and then, you know, we do, so we say we don't, we say there's a big market, but we have, you know, at market, we are typically selling out our flowers, but not until the end of the day. So we don't have a whole lot of capacity to expand there necessarily at the farmer's market. The CSA, probably we could grow more, but we don't push it real hard. We do cut off our, because then when you do 25 bouquets a week, now you're committed to those 25 bouquets for six months. Mm -hmm. So that's fine all summer long, you know, a lot of sunflowers. Until but October. September, October. Yeah, October. Yeah, October is terrifying. You get the first frost, and suddenly every you know <laughs> half of your three quarters of your flowers go away, and so that's a little nerve wracking, and we're learning how to deal with that. But still, that's kind of a big question mark. So we don't oversell that, um, and and then the uh, the other thing is just balancing it with all the other stuff we've got going on, and so trying to figure out. We we really do believe strongly in diversity, and so it's one of the one thing that I love about flowers from the from a non-flower grower original perspective was the diversity within flowers is phenomenal. I mean, you have so many families compared to like vegetables. You got brassicas, nightshades, and uh, sunflowers. Sunflowers. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some, some, you know, lettuce. Lettuce. And, yeah. So legume. Well, we don't grow very many legumes, so yeah, we stay away from those. Do you find procedures or process help your labor to be faster? Right. So that's the other big I, challenge for us is I standardizing. Found is doing the same thing all the way through till it's done, then do another thing all the way. Because I was mm -hmm. doing this, 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 and this, and then right. move to the next one, and mm -hmm. taking forever. Once I started, just do this one thing, all the way down through the whole world, mm -hmm. and then do the next thing, it helped a lot. Yeah. So sure and that's harvest, you know, that, that flower harvest is exactly that thing, where you're just yep. again and again and again until the whole bed is picked. and. Um, Learning to do that fast and efficient, you know, there's the one of the things that we've figured out is if you think of what you're doing as a almost like a sport, a challenge, something putting that mentality into it, like how can I do this faster? Because it's interesting to to try this out and try a different, you know, initially you may do a different move and it's not quite as efficient, but after you practice it ten times, you go, oh, actually this is a little faster. Um, that's something that, that both of us enjoy the challenge of. Uh, but yeah, those are probably the main challenges to scaling up is kind of, you know, the land base, labor, um, and then, the, you know, market-wise, I think we, if we got a lot bigger, we would need to reach out to a lot more. I would say we would need to do a little bit more legwork on marketing and to get a lot really bigger. And we don't really want to. to do that right now. <laughs> you know, Kimmy and I have this conversation every year about, like, should we just cut this back to just the two of us? Like, maybe we should just be solo farmers. Not because we don't enjoy the camaraderie and the community and all that, because we do, which is why we keep doing it with the community, but there are times when it's also just, it feels like, um, I mean, we, we regularly have the conversation like, what, what can I go do now to get my hands in the dirt and actually do something that, you know, just, just transplant something or... Instead of manage? Yeah, because most of our days are spent managing and showing people what to do, and, and but then like, you know, do it twice and then walk away, yeah. and sometimes it's nice just to dig for a while or just to, you know so so that's kind of part of it too is we're trying to figure out where we want to be scale wise and and right now we're we're right in that like 
maybe it's our sweet spot. Maybe it's even just slightly bigger than we want to be. So, so it's getting close to 8 o'clock. And not that I'm shutting down the conversation, but we passed out an evaluation. And if you don't mind to fill that out for us, uh, Curtis and I would very much appreciate that. There's two sides to it. And uh, yeah, let's, let's thank Curtis and Debbie for opening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we've walked the fields, we've checked out what's going on. Of course, there's a lot of stuff under row cover, so I'm sorry there wasn't more to see. Uh, but we have that helps you understand what it takes to produce flowers for Mother's Day. We uh, hope also this has helped you figure out, do flowers fit on your farm? And if so, how do we go about making those uh, target dates and how do we plan for success? Because like we said, a uh, failure to plan is a plan to fail. If you enjoyed this, please make sure you hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, check out our other videos. And if you have questions or comments, put them in the, in the links below, the comments below. And uh, as we have time, we'll be glad to respond to you. And come see us on the farm. If you're local, we do these twilight walks the third Wednesday of every month in the summertime from 6 to 8 p.m. It's a pretty reliable thing. So check out our Facebook page to learn more about that. We love to share what we do and hope you get value of it as well.